Um, so I welcome back to the workshop, day two. Um, uh, and uh, we have our first keynote talk today. Uh, now I want to introduce our speaker, Xiaowen Chen. Um, uh, Xiaowen has been working on the CGM since before we knew it was called the CGM. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when we thought about uh, how do how how do gas is hail is dependent on hail and gas? Uh, she's worked on everything from the CGM around dwarfs to the CGM uh, around uh, massive elliptical galaxies. So I thought that would be a good way to kick off our consideration of this question. So I'm going to stop sharing and ask Xiaowen to start sharing and uh, get going on our talk. Okay. Um, so. Good morning for those who are in the U.S. and uh, evening for those who are outside of the U.S. Glad to be here today. As Mark said, um, I've been working on um, glaciers here with properties for a while now. Uh, it has been an exciting time, and uh, I'm glad to be here to share some of my perspectives. And, uh, and also, as Mark mentioned, this week's motivating question is on how glaciers halo depend on uh, gaseous halo properties depend on halo mass. And specifically, my assignment is about how um, uh, the cool phase in the uh, gaseous halo depend on halo mass up to, from low mass scale up to uh, about 10 to the 13th solar mass. And understand that Megan will be uh, focusing more on the X-ray properties of more massive halos on Thursday. So uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, some of my long-term collaborators listed down here. In particular, I want to highlight uh, my former students who, uh, whose work I will be highlighting in the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, they are Yun Xin Huang, a finishing grad student at University of Arizona. Sean Johnson, a starting assistant professor at the University of Michigan and Arbor. And uh, Fari Zahedi, a Carnegie Fellow at uh, Santa Barbara Street. Uh, so just a quick outline. Uh, basically, to answer the question of how gaseous halo depend on halo mass, I'm going to uh, approach this from different two different angles. Uh, first, I will uh, outline what we have learned based on the ensemble statistics, uh, average uh, properties uh, around uh, different uh, halo populations. And then I will move into more detailed discussion about uh, different physical properties of individual halo content. But um, before uh, we get into the detail, I'd like to cover some uh, brief background overview just to bring us on the same page. So uh, I'd like to start with this uh, uh, galaxy mass function. Uh, basically, this is a theoretical view of uh, that summarizes the success and uh, also some issues remaining in our understanding of galaxy formation and evolution. What you see here, this is the expectation assuming a cosmic mean of uh, baryon fraction in dark matter halos. And uh, different curves show different expectations from different simulation work. Uh, if you can uh, squint your eyes, you can see data points. These are observations. <clears throat> Uh, on the x uh, scale, uh, x-axis scale, you can see the uh, stellar mass ranges from anywhere below 10 to the 9 to beyond 10 to the 12 solar masses. And it's well known that uh, the stellar mass fraction uh, is suppressed at both low and high mass end. And conventionally, this is understood as due to feedback uh, at low mass end specifically, uh, it's being attributed to star um, supernova feedback uh, in the low mass dwarfs, while at high mass end, uh, AGN feedback is frequently invoked. And you can see that uh, while it provides a general success in suppressing the stellar mass fraction, um, there's still a lot of scattered in different theoretical models. In fact, if you look at observations, there's also sufficient uh, non-negligible uh, discrepancy between different measurements. So I think it's good to keep that in mind. But what's relevant uh, for the discussion today is naturally, when we talk about feedback inside galaxies, one would also expect 
that uh, they will also influence the surrounding engagers halos. And this is a, a nice cartoon I borrowed from uh, Andre Kropsov from his talk in Evanston around two years ago that shows the complex interplay between uh, gas and uh, starburst uh, feedback. You can see a uh, pristine ga gas coming in from the IGN feeding star formation as uh, the star formation kick um, the material out into the halo, we would expect that uh, the properties of the uh, gaseous halo to be mod modified accordingly. So understanding uh, the properties, you have you know, a good picture of how the CGN properties change with time across different mass range really provides uh, a, a critical and independent constraint on the overall galaxy formation and the booster model. And um, so this is a comprehensive plot. Again, I borrowed from uh, this nice review article by Jason Thomason, Molly Peebles, and JS Work from, uh, from 2017. What show, it shows here is uh, from the, in the background, you can see the grayscale um, um, particle distribution that shows the temperature and density phase diagram of the fused gas content. It goes from uh, high density, low temperature up to uh, low density and high temperature regime. And on top of that, you can see, uh, you know, for many decades now, quasar absorption spectroscopy has provided a very sensitive tool to probe this gaseous content because there are so many uh, different line transitions that serves as very uh, sensitive tracer of these different phases of the diffuse gas. And um, for, the, uh, for the context of this talk in particular, when we talk about cool gas content, I have very uh, liberally extend the temperature range up to beyond uh, almost 10, uh, a million degree Kelvin. So this is the range that uh, I want you to focus on today for today's talk. Beyond about a million degree Kelvin, I expect that will be covered uh, on Thursday. And uh, within this sort of cool gas phase, you can see uh, this is more than just the alphabet soup, but um, there are many sensitive strong absorption lines that will come in at different wavelengths that's shown in the upper right panel here. As a function of redshift, you can see most of them really occurred in the UV range that requires a Hubble Space Telescope UV spectrograph. Uh, and that's why we're we are here today because there have been tremendous progress coming out of many different uh, survey projects using in particular the cos cosmic region spectrograph in the past decade. Um, a couple exceptions here uh, are the magnesium two doublet that's down here. That's really uh, provides a very sensitive tracer for dense and uh, cold gas that, uh, that arise both in the ISM and also in uh, dense clumps, presumably dense clumps in the uh, gaseous halo. So magnesium-2 and iron-2, uh, a number of iron-2 lines can serve as a, a sensitive tracer of uh, diffuse gas at a relatively low redshift and uh, easily accessible on the ground. So um, in case you're not familiar with why, if you have questions about why people care about magnesium-2, this is the reason. And you're gonna hear more about magnesium too later in a moment. And in terms of uh, mass dependence, uh, I like this uh, figure from one of Ben's uh, recent papers uh, from uh, Eagle Zoom that shows the expected uh, extent of low ions as shown in the top row traced by silicon two from low mass uh, at 10 to the 11 solar masses to high mass beyond 10 to the 13 solar mass. In contrast, you can see uh, what we see uh, or what the simulation uh, show in terms of the uh, high ions. Again, so uh, traced by O6 uh, from low mass to high mass N. Um, I mean, without uh, showing any numbers, the visual difference is quite clear that uh, it clearly depends strongly on the mass uh, scale that we are looking at. So um, this is uh, just to give you a general uh, motivation why uh, we should care about the gaseous properties um, 
as a function of mass. But uh, before I move on, I want to highlight a caveat uh, before we get into detailed discussion. While theoretically we want to understand halo gas property as a function of mass, uh, empirically it's actually not so straightforward. And the main reason is mass is not uh, observable. And I think this is a good venue to remind ourselves that um, the way astronomers uh, carry out experiments is we, we detect light. And uh, we actually have to do a number, a, a number of maneuvers in order to convert light to mass. And the caveat comes in uh, immediately um, based on uh, this, uh, that's nicely summarized by the two panels here. This is also extracted from a review article uh, that was put together by Charlie Conroy in 2013. Uh, it shows on the left, the cumulative stellar mass for different initial mass function. And it shows that um, most of any, given any initial uh, stellar mass function, most of the mass lies in, uh, in low mass stars, less than uh, solar mass. Whereas uh, most of the light come out of massive stars. And that's where our observational signal is. So when we talk about mass, the first order business is really we have to specify and justify the use of initial mass function for our analysis. And uh, just as a illustration, uh, I use 16 cos halos red galaxies as an example, uh, plotting the stellar mass estimated using Salpeter function uh, uh, versus uh, stellar mass estimated using the Chabrier uh, initial mass function. There's a clear systematic offset, systematic offset by about 0.2 dex, uh, just between the two um, stellar mass functions alone. And on top of that, Charlie also uh, did a very extensive overview. If you haven't read that article, I encourage you to do so. Uh, depending on the code you use, and there's still different stellar libraries, there will be additional um, uh, systematic differences in the in the result. So that's the first step to go from observed light to halo mass. So now, it, uh, just assuming we can uh, reach an agreement using, uh, based on the stellar mass estimate, the next step is to go from stellar mass to halo mass. And here uh, you can see in the middle, this is uh, the current best estimated, I, I want to say best estimated, but uh, this is the latest result of how stellar mass is related to halo mass from the recent paper by Peter Berlusi, put together by Peter Berlusi in 2019. You can see uh, a more or less monotonic uh, relation from um, uh, 10 to 10, the 10 solar mass in halo mass to out to almost 10 to the 15. Maybe uh, you are more familiar with this, uh, uh, the stellar mass to halo mass uh, relation using the ratio uh, in the y-axis. What I want to emphasize here is uh, on top of the mean relation, there's also a large amount of scatter from different work. So this is all uh, uh, summarized in Peter Beruzzi's latest paper. So you can also uh, check it out. This is in particular at ratio point one, which is relevant to most of the discussion today. Uh, I want to highlight that um, while it shows maybe on average 0.3 deck uh, dispersion in the mean relation, when we put that relation on top of uh, the middle panel, a straightforward stellar mass to halo mass ratio, uh, it's clear, I hope it's clear that, uh, whoops, um, at high mass end, depending on which relation you use, um, it's gonna, it could result in more than an order of magnitude difference in the inferred halo mass. So this is just a cautionary note. I understand, um, I remember Mark mentioned that uh, one of the topics for tomorrow is about zero temperature estimate. So uh, here's one of the fundamental parameters uh, before we go into any derived, uh, further derived parameters, the starting point of the adopted halo mass really is relevant. So I want to uh, 
uh, put that out there before we move on. So now that's the, the background just to highlight uh, one of the main caveats that has been uh, very much on my mind. So moving into uh, the discussion on the uh, halo gas property, I want to uh, start with this summer, uh, summary graph. Uh, just to highlight that how exciting the uh, time has been for the CGN community. And uh, this is just to highlight the mass distribution for different uh, survey samples. And uh, I certainly, I know that uh, many of you can help me to, to advocate uh, for the fact that there are actually more sample than I can accommodate here. Uh, in addition to the low mass uh, dwarf sample that was put together by Sean Johnson back in 2017, now updated with new uh, data from the Muse Cube survey led by Yoshe in Leiden, um, plus the luminous red galaxy sample that my group has been focusing on for the past few years. There's uh, many other surveys in addition to cos halos, cos dwarfs. Uh, I want to say uh, what comes to mind include cost burst and cost gas, uh, plus um, individual efforts. But the main point is uh, we have a lot of data, enormous amount of data at low redshift range for a very uh, for a detailed study of the CGM property. Right now we have sample that covers anywhere from 10 to the seven uh, solar masses in stellar mass up to 10 to the 12 uh, solar masses. In comparison, uh, I want to borrow this to show that uh, I'm not sure if there's gonna be a talk on the high redshift universe. When I prepared, was putting together the talk, I feel like there should be, uh, you know, there's a, another axis that goes a uh, uh, point in time, going back to high redshift uh, in terms of the halo gas property but uh, given the time limit, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but just want to point out that in this uh, left panel here, the green histogram shows the effort coming out of the KBSS survey from Caltech that uh, a high redshift, a redshift two-ish, uh, it's really difficult to prove the low mass range, but there's an enormous set of data that focuses on 10 to the 10 solar mass range. Um, and, um, what you're gonna hear uh, a lot about is this new survey that focused on magnesium two surge. You know, the, uh, the tracer we used, I mentioned earlier, that's sensitive to uh, dense and cool clumps, both in the ISM and in the uh, circumgalactic space. What's shown here is a mass distribution of the latest sample that we put together from the M3 survey, which I will uh, describe in a moment, plus, a, a large set of luminous red galaxy coming out of the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey that uh, Yunxing had uh, studied about five years ago now. So it is mainly uh, using this combined sample that we are able to uh, learn quite a bit about the, um, the mean properties of cool clumps in uh, a wide range of halo mass. So just a few words on the M3 survey. This is the Magellan Mage Magnesium 2 Halo project that, uh, that's that been going on for uh, almost a decade now in collaboration with Steve Shackman at Carnegie. This is uh, a large sample of galaxies blindly selected from Sloan that occurred in a close projected, in close projected distance from a background quasar. All together, we collected 380 galaxies a ratio of less than uh, 0.5. And um, I want to mention before I go on that uh, incidentally in parallel, there's an independent effort coming out of the Durham group led by uh, Miguel Fumagalli uh, that who also published a, a paper just last year on the magnesium two halo gas property at ratio of one. And uh, the surprising thing is their finding is very much consistent with what we see at low redshift. Um, so just to continue uh, uh, just summarizing the sample property. So of all the 380 galaxies, you can see uh, the redshift distribution 
and also impact parameter distribution between the quasar sideline and the location of the galaxy. It goes all the way out to about 500 kpc, and it covers a wide range in luminosity. That's something we can robustly measure. It goes from uh, less than a tenth L star to super L star. And because of the uh, slow, you know, um, really exquisite slow data, multi-band photometric data, we're able to do a comprehensive uh, stellar population synthesis analysis to constrain both stellar mass and also using the spectra to infer the specific star formation rate based on the observed H-alpha uh, line flux. Uh, using that, we can uh, separate, subdivide our sample into star forming blue sequence with uh, active star formation in the recent past, and also more quiescent sample that has not uh, shown uh, really prominent star formation also uh, in the last couple uh, giga years. And uh, just to uh, convince you, given the caveat outlined earlier, that uh, in terms of estimating the stellar mass using the multi band pass data, we are pretty confident about the overall scaling, the linear relation between uh, luminosity, intrinsic luminosity and stellar mass, coupled with um, the intrinsic difference in the star formation history uh, that can be roughly captured by their red frame optical color between uh, the optical and red band. And that's also clearly shown here. Uh, the main thing is, despite uh, the uncertainty in the zero point in, in the in exact stellar mass scale, we are very confident about the overall scaling uh, between within the sample itself. So moving further into the, um, the magnesium two halo property, out of this uh, M3 sample, we are able to quantify the magnesium two absorption strength as a function of distance. At the top, you can see this is the inferred covering fraction incidence of the magnesium two uh, transition. There's a general decline in terms of the incidence of the clumps. And uh, the points here are further divided into the blue and red galaxies that I mentioned earlier. And like um, before, we have uh, tried to improve the inverse correlation we see here, the overall decline as we move to larger distances in the um, magnesium 2 strand. When we actually include the mass scaling, normalize the projected distance by mass, to account for the uh, size scaling relation. Uh, it's clear that the inverse correlation is further tightened. And at the top, you can see that uh, the incidence of these uh, magnesium two features really decline rapidly uh, beyond 100 kpc for a typical uh, Milky Way type galaxy. We can uh, further move into using halo radius as inferred from halo mass I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, that tells us uh, while further confirming the, the continuing declining trend toward larger radii, but also shows that uh, the incidence of this cool uh, clump, these cool clumps revealed by magnesium two really dropped uh, really quickly beyond roughly half of the rear radii in these halos. So uh, putting everything together in terms of uh, the mass dependence, that's the uh, main theme of this talk and this week, the workshop of this week. Uh, this is showing the mean gas covering fraction, mean cool gas covering fraction. Uh, as proved by the magnesium two feature. Average within the fiducial gaseous radius I mentioned earlier, roughly half of the rear radii versus the inverse stellar mass. This is combining our M3 magnesium two sample with the Sloan luminous red galaxy sample into the um, 10 to the 13 solar mass region. So at the bottom, you show our inverse stellar mass at the top is the uh, inferred halo mass uh, using a relation that was published by Andre Kostov back in 2018. 
and uh, you can see a, a, a very clear decline. Uh, in addition to there's the mass dependence, as you go to a higher mass, uh, the incidence of these cool clumps appear to uh, drop very fast. Uh, there's also a difference between different uh, galaxies of different star formation history. And that's captured by this next plot that shows the mean gas covering fraction as a function of specific star formation rate. And uh, that immediately raised this question about whether uh, the origin of these magnesium-2 absorbers, are they coming out of um, starburst-driven outflows or uh, is due to uh, accretion that um, comes in from uh, outside of the halo? Uh, so to, to really address this question, uh, it's non-trivial, of course. Uh, correlation doesn't mean cause that. Um, causality, but um, there are a few hints that we can uh, we can get from just looking at the data, um, the observations themselves. The first one I would note is um, there's a reason why we are very interested in studying uh, these luminous red galaxies, given the fact that they haven't been forming stars for a couple billion years. Uh, we continue to see abundant uh, presence of these cool clumps in these massive halos. And in addition, when we actually look into the gas kinematics, we see that uh, this is again ensemble average over uh, a, a sample of uh, a thousand galaxy absorber pairs. We see that the velocity dispersion of the absorber around these luminous red galaxies appear to be subvirial. It's less than what we would expect just based on the simple inference um, based on uh, viral motion. And uh, this is nicely illustrated uh, by this um, um, recent paper from Afruni and uh, uh, in, the, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, what they show is this is, can be uh, explained by uh, the clumps moving uh, through a hot halo, experiencing the drag, uh, have the energy being uh, dissipated through the ram pressure drag uh, in the interaction with the hot halo. And that has a lot of implication for uh, basically the mass accretion rate and also the survival time scale. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will uh, leave the detail to a later discussion. But uh, so in order for the uh, ram pressure drag to be effective, that imposed a strong limit on the mass of the clump, individual clumps that presumably are falling through the hot halo. Using a simple assumption, the limit we work out is, uh, is actually quite stringent, up to 10 to the four solar mass level. And if we just assume a typical hot halo profile, the expectation is the clouds will eva evaporate. And, um, but when we look into the M3 galaxy sample, that's more typical of L-star galaxies. To our surprise, we don't see such suppression in terms of the velocity dispersion. In more typical uh, mass uh, halos, we see that either it's less than uh, 10 to the, two times 10 to the 10 solar masses or uh, just beyond that the observed velocity dispersion is very comparable to what we would expect uh, based on viral motion. And uh, using the same calculation, we would infer either uh, the clump is more massive in these uh, lower mass halos, uh, it will have to be more than 100,000 solar masses, or there's this a strong implication on the properties of the uh, hot halo around these uh, galaxies. I expect this is an area we will learn a lot more in the CNBS4 era when uh, the Sumyal Zalovich observation will be more sensitive down to this kind of low mass scale. Or perhaps uh, in the Lynx era, maybe they will be able to probe down to uh, 10 to the 12 solar mass halo, uh, the, you know, put some constraint on the, on the hot plasma around these uh, relatively low mass galaxies. So I want to mention that uh, 
this is what we observe at the low redshift, the velocity dispersion between the cool clocks and the galaxies appear to be either comparable to what we expect from real motion in the halo or suppressed in more massive luminous red galaxy halos. This is very different from what people see at high redshift universe. And this is a plot I borrow from Gwen Rudy's paper from 2019 that shows that many of the uh, galaxies show absorption systems that exceed the escape velocity uh, expected for these galaxies. So while they are, uh, so again, um, when coupled with uh, star formation history, we do see very different behaviors uh, between galaxies from different epochs. So uh, before I move on to low mass uh, dwarfs, I want to also mention that in addition to magnesium too, we are now also able to put constraint on uh, the O6 halo in terms of the mean uh, O6 gas covering fraction. What you see here at the top panel is the mean covering fraction for O6 from 10 to the A solar mass halo in stellar mass out to again, uh, LRG level. At the top, just to uh, for contrast and comparison, this is the inferred halo mass uh, for these uh, different galaxy sample. Down here, we show the mean O6 calm density. And this is really uh, because of the a, a large amount of uh, HST data that allows us to put constraint on the total gas calm density. And in comparison to simulation expectations, again, from one of Ben's paper back in 2018. While you know, between O6 and Enesium 2, you can see that they come from uh, very different ionization states, but we see a general overall decline in terms of the incidence and presence of these ions as we move into the high mass regime. Um, and um, so now moving into the low mass halos, uh, in this particular uh, talk, I want to focus on really low mass content, below 10 to the 9 solar masses. This is really, uh, if you recall back to the, the first plot I showed, this is where theoretical uh, work expects supernova feedback dominates uh, the, um, uh, the um, feedback, basically drive the uh, suppression of star formation in these low mass halo. And this was made possible by uh, you know, continuous effort in finding these low mass gas galaxies from uh, deep galaxy surveys. This is part of Sean Johnson's thesis he started out with, uh, with a very complete data set. We can identify these dwarfs that are relatively isolated with no uh, nearby massive galaxies, meaning they are not satellites, but uh, more likely to be central galaxies. And right now we have increased this, the sample to do uh, much more uh, statistically representative study. But just to show you what we are talking about here, this is a field, uh, a, a very uh, fortunate field we, where we see two of the such examples. Uh, I want to highlight this, uh, the so-called D1 here at uh, 16 kpc from the background quasar. Uh, from available uh, HSD spectra, we see uh, a series of uh, absorption features, including hydrogen, O6, and uh, other ions. Um, so for those who are not familiar with this, uh, this kind of plot, uh, just know that the zero velocity here corresponds to the systemic uh, redshift of the galaxy. So when we put the absorption uh, feature centered on the systemic velocity, the line of sight dispersion gives us some measure of the gas kinematics projected along the line of sight. Uh, what I want to point out is uh, for this kind of high resolution data, you can see many of these uh, metal lines are resolved into, in this case, minimum of two components. In addition, when you compare that with hydrogen absorption, you can see clearly that between the two components, there are differential ionization state. The weaker H1 components turned out to have stronger uh, metal ion absorption. 
uh, this is the first indication of um, the presence of multi-phase gas that uh, coming out of a very different ionization state. And we can do that now with uh, exquisite data from the high resolution spectrograph. And uh, that really enable us to do a detailed, uh, to derive constraints on the uh, ionization state of the gas. Uh, that I will come to back to that in, in a moment, but uh, to continue on the topic on the low mass dual of regime. This is based on the initial sample that Sean put together. We can uh, do the usual experiment just to look at the absorption strength as a function of distance. In this case, it's been normalized by the halo radius to, to see that how the absorption strength would evolve with, uh, would change between uh, with the distance and those are different uh, halo mass. If I just blink between the low mass dwarf sample with high mass sample coming out of our own collection, including half halos uh, data point, you can see that the dwarf halos on average produce weaker metal absorption lines. In contrast to hydrogen, there's no visual difference, observable difference in the hydrogen content. But uh, for metal lines, you see that on average, uh, dwarf do not, dwarf halos do not produce a strong metal line absorber. This is also including O6, as uh, shown in the mean uh, carbon fraction earlier. And uh, on top of that, it's also worth emphasizing that beyond viral radius, we don't detect any metal lines. So what, this is significant because uh, going back to the expectation of how supernova feedback may be responsible in reducing the star formation in these low mass dwarfs um, as a result of potentially uh, removal of material out to outside of the dwarf halo. Uh, in this case, either the gas is fully ionized beyond the state of oxygen six or uh, the energetics is not as strong as previously expected. Uh, certainly we hope going forward with more data coming out of us, we will be able to put a uh, strong constraint on the, on the state of the gas that will help to address uh, different possibilities I mentioned here. But in any case, uh, based on the current result, we can already infer uh, you know, the total met metal budget in the dwarf uh, low mass halos. So um, that's, uh, that's the ensemble statistics I wanted to cover. And um, I understand that I'm already up to, uh, I have maybe 10 minutes left. Um, but quickly, I think this is really the most interesting part going forward, especially uh, given the opportunities that are, uh, presented to us now, our ability to really constrain the uh, density and uh, temperature chemical enrichment in these uh, in uh, different gaseous halo using available uh, absorption line data really is right uh, happening right now. And just to illustrate, uh, again, borrowing another uh, figure from Ben's previous papers, this is just uh, by coincidence uh, that I tend to quote Ben's uh, paper. But what you see here is for different elements from carbon at the top, oxygen in the middle, silicon at the bottom, in different ionization state, between different ionization mechanism, we theory can predict very uh, precisely the relative abundance ratio between different ions. Coupled with observations, we are able to uh, constrain the temperature and the density of the gas very well. But the, the key is to really fully utilize what the data has to offer. In this case, uh, on the left, I use an example coming out of the cups sample that shows a single lemon limit system with resolved hydrogen and metal line profile. It's quite clear that the central component here uh, shows zero O6 absorption, but the satellite component with lower H1 condensate actually shows the strong, strongest O6 absorber. It's really each, uh, using this uh, specially resolved component analysis, could we actually 
uh, put strong constraint on the uh, multi-phase gas in individual halos. And we did, we did this using the initial survey, uh, which we uh, call cost LRGs. This is a small sample of luminous red galaxies. This work uh, was done by Fari Zahedi as part of his thesis, PhD thesis, where he uh, fully utilized the resolved um, absorption component as an illustration here. Uh, I'll just show that this single absorber at the 140 kPc here is resolved into a minimum of three components for which we can put strong constraints on in terms of the uh, density and metallicity. Uh, I would just highlight that while the central component uh, dominates the gas density, we were able to, based on the relative line ratio, we were able to put, uh, derive uh, a very strong constraint upper limit on the density of the additional clumps. And we did that, or I should say Fari did that for every one of the uh, 16 uh, systems in our cost LRG sample. And the end result is we see a strong, a large density variation in individual halos. Similarly, uh, as you can imagine, that it also has strong implication on the inferred metal content. Uh, we also see a large scatter in individual halos uh, in terms of the chemical enrichment. Uh, when we compare different elemental abundance, we, we can certainly also look into the relative abundance between alpha elements, which is driven by core collapse supernovae, as opposed to uh, iron with a predominant fraction coming out of uh, supernova 1A or uh, evolved stars. And that we also uh, can see clearly a uh, differential between passive halos and uh, star forming halos. These are all the different possibilities that these high resolution data uh, have offered us. So, but looking into the dynamics of these halos using the inferred density clumps, what, uh, what's shown here is uh, repeated from the previous density panel. And uh, in addition, we have added the density profile inferred from the combined X-ray and Sunyab Zaldovich analysis by Sin et al. back in 2018. This is uh, for the ha, corresponding ha halo. So given the expectation that uh, uh, for this mass range, the uh, halo temperature is of order uh, a million degree and uh, the cool clumped uh, has the expected temperature of 10 to the four Kelvin. If we up, uh, upward correct the density, the measured density profile for the hot halo by a factor of 100 to account for the temperature differential. We see that this hot, uh, the inferred halo uh, density profile for the cool clumps nicely envelope the densest clumps uh, that we inferred uh, from the, uh, the absorption line study. It really uh, shows that very likely these cool clumps, once you take into account the component by component analysis, resolving the density structure, are likely to be in pressure equilibrium with a high halo in these massive halos. You might ask what happened to these low density clumps. We can imagine due to projection effect, these low density clumps may actually arise from larger distances uh, in terms of the 3D radius. And uh, further look into the correlation between density, inferred density and the column density. We see that there's a, a overall, bearing in mind the large scatter, there's a, uh, a rough correlation as you go to high, higher density, uh, the higher density clumps are uh, revealed by high, higher column density absorbers. That gives you a characteristic length scale, size scale of these clumps on the order of 100 parsecs. So this is also quite consistent with what people see using lens quasar side lines at high ratio from Michael's earlier work and also Grant's recent study. Um, so um, we can continue on the analysis to infer the total mass which is also very relevant in terms of the uh, understanding of the gaseous halo. Um, so by simply adding up all the cold clumps, all the column densities, we can infer out to 160 kPc, which is what the sample allows. We uh, 
inferred there's a total of more than uh, 10 to the 10 solar mass cool uh, ma gas mass in the cool phase. That's very much comparable to what people see in star forming halos. And in terms of the mass fraction between cool and hot phase is of order 10%. So um, we certainly, uh, the idea of the two phase model is um, naturally possibly likely simplified. We certainly expect that there's more than just two phase. And that's already evident from a couple of systems from uh, a few systems that we have seen so far. When we look into the comparison between O6 and magnesium two, um, the, very different kinematic profiles that we see, and also the large line width in uh, in the O6 absorber. So we also highlight that uh, there's additional phase, uh, and not not only that, but uh, non-thermal broadening may be driving the line width uh, of these features. So uh, I see that on my uh, computer, the clock is running up almost 45 minutes. So uh, I can either stop here or going on to talking about the COP survey. So Mark, what do you think? Uh, I think let's hear a few words about the survey enough so that people get acquainted enough to ask questions about it in the discussion. Okay. So I want to uh, quickly mention this new survey uh, that's coming out of HSD Cycle 25 Large Geo Program. Uh, it's Cosmic Ultraviolet Baryon Survey uh, that, uh, is, that's designed to study the, uh, the CGN over the redshift range from local all the way up to uh, beyond one, trying to bridge the gap between Cosmic Noon um, and uh, the nearby universe. And the idea really is to try to understand uh, better using all the techniques I uh, just summarized to uh, to probe the gas and galaxy core evolution and also chemical enrichment history. I want to acknowledge a wonderful team that uh, we have. This is every uh, team player. Uh, some of them are on this call here. So um, um, so I just want uh, to acknowledge, acknowledge their contribution. But quickly, over the last three years, uh, we have been very busy in collecting a large number of comprehensive auxiliary data, including ground-based uh, supplemental optical shell spectrum, uh, absorption spectrum to cover the magnesium-2 and iron-2 that I mentioned earlier, and also massive galaxy surveys on Magellan and also VLT using MUSE. To, uh, to complement, to enable a joint absorber and galaxy study. This is just a sum, to give you a, a sense of the survey, the scope of the survey, we have uh, uh, secured more than 800 spectroscopy ratio per field. Uh, that's designed to sort of going deep, really deep in the inner sideline to really uh, complete the, uh, the census. And this is just to show you the, uh, the impact parameter distribution for one field is a function of pressure with a sort of a wedding, wedding cake structure going really deep at the center, uh, 30 arc second radius to progressively shallower out to 11 arc minute in radius. Um, so in the, the first couple of papers are out on the archive. I encourage you to uh, check it out. Like I said earlier, we take full advantage of the spectral resolution that's available from COS and those are ground-based shell data to resolve complex multi-phase gas. And from the accompanying galaxy survey, we see we can we have uncovered a diverse range in terms of galaxy environment. From what you can see that uh, for all five strong lemon limit systems, really optically thick gas, we see a wide range in terms of uh, the halo mass it broke from a uh, low mass dwarfs, you know, this is coming in at 10 to the A solar mass range for this uh, lemon limit system of H1 common C of 17.6 to massive groups uh, that involves a lot of uh, galaxies of different star formation history, showing that uh, H1 common C is by no means a good tracer of uh, the halo mass, but um, also uh, just to look at 
the result uh, density structure and helicity to contrast simply just from looking at magnesium to, to H1 ratio, we can already see a wide range in, uh, in the data. When we do a full-blown analysis that accounts for other ions, we see again in, um, in all of these halos, a range in terms of density structure and uh, chemical enrichment. So uh, again, in terms of going to multi-phase structure, we see a very clear correlation in terms of line width we uncovered for ions with increasing uh, ionization potential. Uh, so this is one, uh, one of the uh, foci, foci uh, that's being analyzed by Tom Cooper um, at the moment. So I think, so I also want to highlight, you know, for any survey, there are surprises. And this is uh, one of the surprises that uh, Aaron Be Becher published uh, last year, uh, the discovery of sequence molecular hydrogen at 40 kpc from a massive elliptical. So going re the recurring theme of multi-phase gas in, uh, in halos of different mass scale. So uh, I'm just gonna leave up the plots here for discussion sake. Going forward, uh, uh, someone was joking about how we are moving into the next generation of CGM analysis. Um, with abundant data, really high quality data available, uh, we are really at the cost of uh, getting a lot of uh, results out. And I'm sure we're gonna hear more about it from Tartrip next week. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll clap audibly since I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay. okay, well, according to my computer, we reached three past the hour. Uh, Shellines had a chance to preview some of the questions. Um, and uh, some of them are compliments. I'm not going to read out the compliments. She can, you, you can read the compliments and, and just smile inwardly while you do that. Um, there's also, uh, Matthias Truskowski has a point about the clump velocities being slower than expected. Uh, I'm not going to read all that because it's more of uh, pointing out a paper by Chowan Rong rather than a question. Uh, I'm going to go down to the question that says, is there a trend with mass for thermal to non-thermal broadening of the lines, especially O6? Right. Okay. Uh, should I uh, share my slide again? I think that'd be helpful. Uh, let me find the relevant plot. So, um, to answer the question, I um, I went over this very quickly. Um, the quick answer is there appears to be. Uh, what you will see here is the grayed out points in the background, the small grayed out points, are from star forming galaxies that include also cause halo sample, I believe. Uh, whereas the color, solid color points are for uh, luminous red galaxies. So just based on uh, you know, the visual comparison here, there, there seem to be uh, a higher fraction of uh, O6 with broadened line width from the massive halos. So this is something we noted in the paper, but certainly we intend, uh, we hope to look at this in more detail with a larger sample coming out of the cups. But, uh, but yes, um, we, at the moment we do see such trend. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Mary Putman. A great talk. I noticed that most of the ma low mass galaxy metal observer points for non-detections. Are the detections biased towards the higher mass galaxies by any chance? Right. So I think this is related to, well, bias in a way that uh, the, the absorption strength coming out of the dwarf halos appear to be weaker. So I think that means we need higher quality of social line data to, to put stronger constraints. So I don't know about in terms of selection bias, I don't think so. I, I think it's unlikely, um, but in terms no, of- I Actually, I was asking for the detections there, Xiao, and are you, um, like there's not many points, are the points that were detections though, are they already the higher mass galaxies? 
No, so for example, this one is the one I uh, highlighted here. In oh, this okay. example. Yeah, I remember this that is, one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a detection. Uh, you can see silicon 3 here uh, at 16 kbc, and this is a very low mass galaxy. It's less than 10 okay, to the 8. So it varies. A lot of what you're saying then is we need higher quality data to get more detections, right? Exactly, yes. All right, uh, next question, uh, Alan Cardita. Extremely insightful talk for massive halos. As you pointed out, it can be cold clumps moving in a hot background wind. Simulations out there indicate their survival requires low T cool to tree free fall. Do these observations have some estimates of such quantities? Uh, quantities in terms of free fall time or? Um, well, I, I, I guess if the line card can clarify. <laughs> yeah, I was just asking the ratio of T equal to T cool, cooling time to free fall time. So that would tell me whether these gas, this cold gas, gas comes will survive or not, right? As far as the simulations are concerned. So do these observations also put some uh, estimates on these quantities in maybe some different ways, which one can compare with these observations then? So, um, so in the paper, we did a, a very simple back, end, back of the envelope calculation. It's not about free fall time because if we, our expectation is, um, is the fact that ground pressure drag might be uh, effective. We, we worked out the, um, the, the ground pressure drag uh, in fall time. So basically the spiraling down time. Um, at, so the conclusion was, and uh, if the clumps were formed at 100 kPC, they would never reach the center, given the mass, um, given the fact that they, they are slowing down, they cannot be too massive. Um, so the, uh, the survival time due to ramp pressure drag force is, um, is much uh, shorter than the, the, you know, the mo modified infall time. Um, and what we find is, but we do see these cold clumps as small radii. So uh, the expectation is they are formed in situ or close to in situ as small radii. Uh, that's the only way we can see them at, uh, at small distances. Uh, and I, I, I just, go ahead, do you have another follow-up? No, no, I just wanted to acknowledge. Go ahead. Uh, I, I've just received the, the very helpful suggestion uh, that uh, to have people uh, Ask the questions themselves so you can uh, see them and hear their voices. <laughs> um, uh, the next question on the list is from Michael Stein. So, Michael, if you're on, please yeah. ask Hi. the question. Verbal. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I was just wondering about this. Yeah, the the, the appearance that you, that you find a um, equilibrium between the cold um, clouds and the hot halo the whole pressure equilibrium. So, where? Would that come from, and is there like what type of process would it would it moderate that, that this equilibrium comes up? So I think maybe we will have more discussion on this uh, to a later part, maybe next week. Um, I mean, there are different possibilities. I think Mark has thought about this a lot. Uh, coming from an observer's perspective, uh, the simple interpretation would be just uh, due to thermal instability. You know the uh, due to density fluctuation, the cool clumps condense out of the hot halo. Um, but uh, certainly, if you uh, think about feedback mod, uh, moderated uh, dynamic state of the gas, uh, that's one possibility as well, you know, the precipitation that Mark uh, has been advocating. Yeah, actually, I'm going to put an ad in here, not, not for what I've been advocating, but for Drummond Fielding's talk next week, because uh, I, I, yeah, I expect him to talk about this issue of um, when things may be in or out of pressure equilibrium as they change phases. Yeah, great. That would be great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, next person up, Todd Tripp has uh, a few questions. Right. Well, so this is the question that always dogs us in this business, which is that oftentimes there are multiple galaxies that are close to the sight line. And this is particularly problematic with the dwarf galaxies because they're often satellites, as you know, in the halos of more massive galaxies. And so in Joe Burchett's 
dwarf galaxy study from a few years ago, there's some plots that show, you know, all the galaxies within some velocity range, and it's really quite gnarly sometimes. So how is your team trying to establish whether the absorption can be uniquely assigned to the dwarf galaxy or whether it might just be stuff in the halo of the more massive thing. And, you know, I, it's, it's very interesting that the metals are much, are, are clearly weaker, but then there's the H1 and the H1, I, I wonder, is that the dwarf seed gem or is that maybe the just stuff in the halo of the bigger galaxy? And the other question was related, which is, how have you, I think you were kind of favoring that the difference between the dwarf CGM and the more massive CGM is that the feedback or something has changed the physical conditions in the halo of the dwarf, but it could also be metallicity. So I was wondering if you could comment on whether it's just lower metallicities in the, in the halos of these little galaxies, which are of course known to have lower metallicities in general. Thanks, okay. Sean. Thank you, Todd. Uh, that, those are many questions. I will try to remember them all. But starting <laughs> off from the beginning, so Mark will help me. Yeah, uh, you can start from the beginning. In the chat. <laughs> uh, on my screen, I can't really uh, see okay. everything. Then I will help you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the first was about the environment, right? Um, so this is why part of the main reason, actually, is the main reason why it's the it's been taking us a while for uh, to do the cup survey. We are very careful about uh, knowing all the caveats we outlined in terms of trying to identify central galaxies as opposed to satellite dwarfs. Um, that's folded into the design of galaxy survey, starting from the first generation O6 survey that John Mulcahy and I started. Our goal is to really go deep at the, in the inner, uh, you know, inner uh, volume from the quasar sideline. By deep, I mean, we we'll try to reach 100% completeness for L-star galaxies at the rest of the interest. Uh, in the case of the dwarfs in Sean Johnson's sample, he went still uh, deeper in identifying some L-star galaxies by combining deep MUSE, you know, integral field unit data. So while the, the survey, the ideal uh, goal is to have 100% completeness to say, uh, with high confidence that there's no um, L-star or brighter galaxies near, within, uh, you know, 300, 500 kpc of the door. Uh, oftentimes, our, uh, we reach about 90% completeness, just to be, uh, you know, really open about uh, the survey status. So with that uh, kind of data, galaxy data set in mind, we can say that these are the isolated dwarfs that we don't see. Our data can can rule out the presence of luminous galaxies within the surrounding uh, 300, 500 kpc volume. And that's the sample that you are looking at uh, in front of you. So, um, so I agree with you, there's definitely ambiguity, but we are doing this, we're trying to make it up from uh, really pondering on the galaxy survey completeness and depth. Cool, so can I, I'll just follow up. You can turn that around what if you look at the CGM of satellite dwarf galaxies? Yeah. Does it look so, different? So uh, that's a complete separate subject. I think I, when I, during the break, I saw somebody else asking about uh, CGM properties in group environment. So maybe I will come back to that when we reach that question. Okay. Uh, in fact, that's Arif's question next. So Arif. Um, no, but Todd, I thought had more questions. Oh, well, he was also asking about metallicity. Okay, could okay. the differences be due to metallicity? So, so yeah, that's definitely one thing we want to address, but I, I should also uh, reiterate that even in high mass halos, we see low, metal, low metallicity clumps. So it's not unique to, uh, you know, low metallicity gas is not unique to low mass uh, halos. But uh, while the challenge in getting the metallicity out for these, uh, the current dwarf sample is, uh, as you can see, this is the H1 coverage we have, both are saturated. Uh, certainly getting a full lumen series to constrain the H1 condensate is crucial. So that's definitely in progress. We, we, that's one of the goals we hope to, uh, to accomplish using the additional COPS sample. 
but at the moment I cannot address, but only to emphasize that uh, low metallicity clumps are present in uh, even high mass halos. Okay. Uh, I guess now we will move on to Arif. Thank you. Uh, actually, Todd set me up quite, quite well. So um, the question is about massive galaxies, particularly uh, extending into group environments. And uh, have you looked at the CGM structure around such systems? And what are some of the highlights? So I would refer, so first of all, I should say that uh, Joe Burchett, that's part of his work. So maybe he will chime in uh, uh, in a moment, but uh, I will refer you to this paper uh, by Rinxin Huang that's on the archive. Uh, given the limit of time, I didn't show the plot. We do have a plot that shows how the magnesium two incidence and strength uh, changes in the group environment. So since I don't have that in my slide, I will just, uh, basically, I will basically hand drawn. Uh, so what we see here is in the group environment, we don't see a trend. Uh, either we use a lightweighted, so, so in the group environment, there is some ambiguity in the x-axis, in the distance measure. Do you use the closest galaxy or you use some sort of more massive galaxy or uh, something else? Uh, in the paper, we opt to use lightweighted center. And this is what we see. Uh, in terms of the overall uh, incidence of the fraction, it's lower. And in terms of the uh, distance dependence in the absorption strength, it's flat. Mm -hmm. And the flat trend does not depend on how the distance is measured. Either we use lightweighted distance or using the closest galaxy because um, um, the, the galaxies all tend to be more luminous. So it, it turns out that they are of older L star or sub L star, very comparable. So light weighted or not, they, the trend is the same, it's flat. And how far in uh, kiloparsecs have you managed to go out? Are you With able sample, to probe? We have limited our effort to 500 kpc. Okay. No, that's a pretty good distance. Okay. Uh, thanks to Sloan. It, it's really, we benefited a lot from the Sloan survey. Right. Great. And I'll Thank ask, you. Uh, Joe, Joe has a question coming up. I'll, I'll ask him to save comments on this topic because this question is related. Um, the next one is from Frank Vandenbosch. Hi. Um, so you showed that the uh, observed velocity dispersion of the cold clumps was um, in massive galaxies was significantly lower than the very expectation. And then there was an idea that this could have something to do with RAM pressure stripping, which then in turn results to a mass limit on the clouds. Um, but in order to meaningfully interpret such a velocity dispersion, you need to know something about the radial distribution of the clumps. Um, right? So if, if they, for example, they're spatially biased, they're very much more centrally concentrated in the dark matter, then they would have naturally a lower velocity dispersion. You don't need to invoke any RAM pressure or any of that. So my question is, if you take the incidence as function of radius and you try to translate that into a radial number density profile of clouds, what does it look like? Does it look like NFW-like? In other words, they're like close to an unbiased tracer of the halo, or is it more concentrated, less concentrated? Uh, not sure if we, but so for the calculation, the assumption is a sort of as a thermal distribution in terms of density clumps. Uh, in, from the observation, going back, how do we infer? But ha halos are not isothermal, right? So, so we know that that. Um, so, if, if if you if your cloud suppose would be much more centrally concentrated, okay, they, they never make it out to more than half the variable radius. Then the velocity dispersion of the clouds should be significantly lower than the velocity dispersion sigma v they infer from the halo mass. Right. Um... Well, I think it really depends on the scale length. Um, not sure if we can put all the clumps within the inner radius. The, I mean, it exceeds, the projected distance already tells you the minimum distance that they can be. Uh, yeah, that was the projection, right? So I, I wanna translate yeah. the instant rate so you make a model for the clouds and give them cross section per cloud and then you can translate right. your instant rate to a number density profile. Yeah. Um, so even though you say, uh, is, is this true? I understand that, um, not sure about Bariana Halo. In an earlier paper I had of mine, 
we I use the isothermal profile to describe the the observed magnesium two profile, and it, it actually was quite it did quite well. So that's that's a different so it's, it's sort of forward modeling. Um, I didn't fit I didn't infer backwards of the density profile. I just assume this is isothermal and see if it fits and it fits. So I don't know if that's good enough answer, but I, I just want to emphasize that we the clouds come out. Uh, a lot of them come out of uh, you know 40 kpc, 50 kpc, 100 kpc, and beyond. So that says the minimum radius that the clouds can come from, right? So when you say the clouds can come from the uh, because of projection that could come from inner radius, th there's a minimum there. It cannot all come from the inner radius. I understand. It. I, I think I think simply summarize the question is basically: Has anyone tried to? translate the incidence assumption of radius into a number density profile of clouds. And that's what I'm interested in. To some extent, is as I said, I use the isothermal profile, it fits the, uh, the observed projected profile. So I don't know if that's good enough. OK. OK. Uh, uh, the next question is from Pratik Sharma. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, nice talk. Uh, so I had a question about how you infer this clump mass and the clump size and the column density. If you can you know, briefly tell us about that. So those are two different methods. So the clump mass here really is very simply using the fact that the cloud, uh, you know, in this case, we just assume that the observed uh, velocity is the terminal velocity and the infer the mass limit that way. But in terms of the size that you saw, that's really from uh, a full-blown ionization analysis uh, given, given the uh, inferred clump density, that's the space density. We also know the ionization fraction. And uh, modify that, we can infer the corresponding H1 space density with the observed column density, that's how we infer, you know, the clump size here. So two different sets of uh, analyses. Mm -hmm. And they agree that, with each other, right? The yes. mass agrees with the-, the Yes, IM but, uh, you know, the, the size has a wide range, but roughly speaking, order of magnitude, yes. Right. So I had actually a related question about this uh, assumption of, uh, terminal velocity and you know so there are these simulations cloud pressing simulations and also uh, ramp pressure stripping simulations which show that sometimes cold gas can actually grow rather than getting uh, mixed in the tails if the cooling time is short enough right if, if the cooling time of the mixed gas is short enough so what do you think about that uh, connection of that to observations? Uh, to be honest, I haven't considered that possibility, uh, but I, I look forward to the uh, continuing discussion next week uh, to to learn the latest in terms of the theoretical modeling effort. But that, that will be interesting, but it will present a challenge to the observation we have here, I imagine. In terms of the growth of cool clumps. Right. How about we? Yeah. Okay. How about Thanks. we return to that question next week? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben Oppenheimer is next. It's not phrased exactly like a question, but I'll have him speak anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, great talk. I, I liked it quite quite a bit. Um, uh, I was wondering about this exact slide here. Um, the inference of the hot phase. Um, and this is kind of a broader question for 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 everyone here. Um, if we assume a halo mass of ten to the thirteen, and I'm assuming you're you're deriving this from the inferred halo temperature or the virial temperature expected for a ten to the thirteen solar mass halo, and then you derive the density for that you know the hot phase. Um, whether there are you know there's um, there's some you know, you know from stacks from Singadol. Um, for X-ray and TS uh, thermal Sinai Zeldovich, 
But I wonder if there's like individual galaxies um, that have been observed in the last few years um, with XMM that can provide a constraint because I would think that, um, you know, that, you know, density and that temperature of gas should should create some some X-ray signal. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I wonder I if there's... Smitha. Yeah, go ahead. Smitha is here. Um, I think my, my impression is, and she's one of the teams that has reported detection, direct detection in nearby giant spirals, I believe. But I thought my impression, Smitha, please correct me, uh, this X-ray signal doesn't go out to 100 kcc, does it? But, but anyway, Smitha, could you comment? Or is she here? Uh, she was, maybe she's stepped away. I think that, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I will just say, the real question, as you say, is it depends on out to what radius. <laughs> um, there are plenty of LRGs that have been measured out to, um, there's actually observations out to 10 or 20 or maybe even 40 kiloparsecs, but as you start getting beyond that, uh, it gets harder and harder. Uh, it's what we have is consistent to a factor of 10, <laughs> but there's also a, a wide range in uh, the X-ray luminosities uh, or X-ray surface brightnesses out at tens of kiloparsecs. So uh, it's hard to then say uh, if, if there's such a wide range of um, gas densities out there, uh, is it consistent or not with this range of inferred pressures? But we, we would sure love to get deeper X-ray observations of all that. Um, and yeah. the best thing we have now is the stacks. Yeah, I, yeah. The um, there's just a zoo of like elliptical halos out there, and they're very different. And you know, the ones that are LRGs versus the ones that are more massive groups. I mean, you know, and uh, some someone else, Akosh uh, Bogdan, um, has observed a number of these, and I'm always confused about what exactly these things are. Are they LRGs? And sometimes, you know, some of them are pretty bright, but often then they're in a group environment. Okay, so I, I, I see two more uh, questions. I think I can probably comment <laughs> something on this question. So uh, in fact, our group has uh, doing some deep X observations of massive galaxies. Well, there are, it's very complicated here. Uh, there are many problems. I think the detection is largely uh, affected by the background. I mean, it's background limited. So it's not really going deeper as you can get to larger radii. But based on stacking analysis, we can now go to at least uh, one or 200, uh, 100 or 200 kiloparsec from the galaxy for most massive galaxies. So that's why the problem is, one of the key problem is what you are talking about. If you are talking about CGM, so you have to uh, separate the contribution from the intracluster medium and from the CGM. So in this case, you'd have to choose the cleanest cases. And for this such massive galaxies, most of them are just located in the center of clusters and only very few of them are isolated. So the case is very complicated, I mean. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we'll have two more questions, uh, one from Joe Burchett and one from Kartik Sarkar. So Joe, you're up. Yeah, um, if I could just comment on a couple of things uh, earlier. Uh, it, it actually leads up to my question, if that's okay. Uh, go, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So um, so about the, the, the issue of dwarf galaxies around um, uh, uh, analyzing the CGM of dwarf galaxies due to the proximity of more massive galaxies, um, in the 2016 paper I led, we actually did try to separate galaxies, dwarfs that were not within the virial radius of another more massive galaxy. And, um, and, and consistently, uh, we find uh, much lower covering fractions of carbon-4 uh, in, the, in the lower mass galaxies relative to uh, uh, the sort of L-star-ish galaxies. Um, and regarding the CGM in group and cluster environments, uh, we... Um, uh, I've also found a much lower covering fraction of H1 in groups and clusters uh, than around uh, uh, isolated l starish galaxies, less massive galaxies, um, and a suppression of carbon-4 in the more massive uh, groups. Um, and uh, I also point out that uh, uh, Nikki Nielsen and uh, Stephanie Poynton have looked at uh, the kinematics of magnesium-2 and O6 in group environments, and 
it's complicated. Uh, the 06, uh, there seems to be, uh, the, the, the profiles seem to be on average narrower in group environments, which is kind of interesting, whereas the magnesium two are potentially broader. Um, but getting back to the, co the issue of, of covering fraction uh, and H, uh, uh, H1 contents, um, because we find so much less H1 uh, in the CGM of group and cluster galaxies, uh, and there's a seemingly a plethora in the LRG halos, uh, there is a little bit of a redshift difference here between my X-ray bright sample at about redshift 22 and Xiaowen, uh, your LRG sample, uh, you know, average redshift of what, about 0.4. So uh, I'm just curious if you had some comments on this potential discrepancy. Uh, so just to clarify the discrepancy in terms of the uh, H1 content. That's right. So, um, so here, in, I want to, it just reminded me of uh, one thing I should have mentioned. Uh, so what you see here is in terms of equivalent width, in terms of the lemma alpha, and that's really driven by necessity that we don't have, uh, the, because this is a strong line, the single line is saturated, we can't constrain the H1. But uh, like all the saturated lines, the equivalent width really is measure, measuring uh, the underlying kinematics. My expectation is a lot of these may be contributed from the correlated structure where the galaxies reside. Uh, so, so it's not really unique in, uh, or um, really in, entirely inside the dwarf galaxy halo. Um, but uh, in terms of the luminous red galaxy, so you're saying we, we see a larger fraction of halos with high competency absorber when uh, you don't see that in the low ratio. Um, so I think uh, for cost LRG, the sample is quite small. As I said, it's 16 within 160. I forgot how big your sample size is. Um, I'm not sure how much of this is, uh, is part of the noise given the limited sample size. It would definitely, I think it argues for a continuing effort to enlarge the, the sample size. So, so could you remind me the, how many galaxies were there in your sample? Yeah, so the X-ray bright clusters, I mean, it was, it was maybe uh, um, you know, 10 or 11 galaxies um, and those were spread across you know, uh, five clusters or so. Right. And uh, also going out to much further distance away, right? It's not within, so 160 would be about a third of the viewer radii for these massive halos. If I remember correctly, you go out to beyond the viewer radii with these clusters. Well, the, the, the sight lines are actually, um, the sight lines are, are within a variable radius largely of the cluster, but um, I'm talking about galaxies that we went back and surveyed and found galaxies near the sight line. So, so those are definitely well within a virial rate, you know, what would be the nominal virial radius of a sub halo uh, for mm -hmm. those galaxies. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about impact parameters of like hundred kiloparsecs from the galaxies themselves, where you would certainly expect to see, you know, plenty of H4. Okay. Right, right. So I guess uh, it would be good to look at uh, in more detail about the, you know, the galaxy environment. It's, um, it's possible because we do see that for galaxies that are in group environment, uh, the incidence of even just magnesium two is indeed lower. So I'm not sure how much of that could be explained by the environmental effect. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I, think, I think Mark was, was interjecting here. I was gonna say, um... How, how about that? That discussion can continue on Slack. Uh, we're going to have one more question. Uh, yet another question has appeared since I said there were two more questions. Uh, it's from Crystal Martin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this whole chat into the Slack channel, uh, Halo 21 Week 1 Halo Mass. And I'll ask Xiao Wen to address Crystal's question there <laughs> so that the discussion can segue and, and people who need to be elsewhere can can uh, do that after this last question is answered. It's from Kartik Sarkar. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I was uh, uh, wondering, like, uh, what would be the effect of uh, assuming a different radiation field in the ionization calculation when uh, 
when someone estimates the density of these uh, uh, clumps, you know, cold or warm clumps. So if we, let's say, if we uh, increase the density uh, radiation field by a factor of two, would that change the estimation of the density? So uh, the second question is that, uh, uh, is there any estimation uh, that uh, if we, uh, estimation of this density, if we don't assume that the clumps are in ionization equilibrium, instead assume some kind of non-equilibrium uh, formation scenario, uh, what would be the density estimation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so going back to your first question, great question. Um, um, so, so, I mean, this is a, uh, one of the challenges in doing this kind of uh, analysis. Uh, it's not just the intensity radiation, but also the slope of the spectrum. So if, so to answer your question, I imagine you're talking about at the lemma edge, if the uh, intensity changes by a factor of two, uh, the density will change accordingly because what we have here under a simple photoionization model is really the ionization parameter, which is the ionizing photon or I should say hydrogen ionizing photon per uh, hydrogen particle that, that we have constraint for. So if the number of ionizing photons at 13.6 EV changes, uh, the inferred density will change accordingly. But I'm more confident about uh, uh, the uncertainty in the slope of the ionizing spectrum, particularly for the optically thick gas. So, uh, but going below optically thick regime in the, into the optically thin regime will be more worrying about the effect on the slope change or difference in the ionizing spectra. But within the optically thick regime, hydrogen does help us filtering out all these, um, the effect um, of the high energy photons. So our results will be, uh, is actually quite robust, uh, you know, in that context. Right, and but uh, the estimations for the you know many lines like uh, many lines like silicon three, carbon four, they have high ionization potential. So they are probably your uh, slope of the uh, background or any spectrum that you are assuming will matter yeah. a lot. Yeah. So so what I'm trying to say is the spectrum if they are within the hydrogen cloud, much of the photon is filtered out. Uh, so that gives us a little bit that reduces the effect mm -hmm. that you are. Uh, you expect quite a bit. Okay. Nice. But, but nice. I, I agree with you, once you include higher ions, you, we do need to be careful. Uh, I forgot your second question. Yeah, so, so, sorry, uh, the second question is that, uh, what happens if we don't assume the ionization equilibrium uh, at all? Like instead assume some kind of formation scenario for these clumps. Uh, so how much uh, will the uh, density estimations change like for example in one of the uh, slides you showed uh, a plot from uh, Oppenheimer's Benjamin Oppenheimer's uh, paper shows that the effect of non-equilibrium uh, effect uh, ionization which is the changing the column densities or ionization fractions by a lot so is there any such estimation uh, that how much it can change the estimation of the density uh, we are looking into that uh, right now the density, uh, yeah, once you get into the non-equilibrium regime, it gets really much more complicated. Um, I don't have a number for you. Okay, there is some, right. well, at least think, trial. <laughs> right, Thanks. I'm gonna ask for the discussion now to transition as smoothly as possible <laughs> onto Slack, where I've put uh, the whole chat thread, including another question that came in after I said I was gonna put the chat thread there. I want to thank uh, Xiao Wen again for uh, a really excellent talk and an excellent question and answer session. And um, we're now going to do it by Slack, uh, continue whatever discussion people want to have. Thank you all. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.